When we make an investment, we understand not to expect immediate returns. Instead, we make a sacrifice in the here and now, expecting a future payoff. Well, today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg describes the importance of sacrificing now for things that will have eternal ramifications. He's titled this message, Spiritual Investing. I invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, where we resume our studies in Philippians. We noted that we live in a spirit in an age that is marked by a spirit of discontentedness, and the challenge to be different is uh, a quite radical call to a lifestyle that is markedly um, distinctive from those around us. In my follow-on study in Bridging 13 and into 14, I came across a poem which expresses very, very aptly the discontent which is so prevalent in our society. The the author writes as follows. It was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted, to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted. (laughs) The youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted. The presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, but I never got what I wanted. Now, that finds a reverberating chord in each of our lives if we are prepared to be honest for a moment or two. And equally challenging is what now follows in relationship to the circumstances which were peculiarly those of the Apostle Paul and the Philippian church. Let me introduce it by giving you one of the doggerels that my father used to confront me with regularly— Ever since I was small and unwilling to share with my sisters, he would say to me, there was a man they said was mad. The more he gave away, the more he had. Which would befuddle my tiny mind insofar as, especially if I was parting with money, and I had uh, half a crown, and I was to give one of my sisters sixpence, that would leave me with two shillings, which would be less than two and six. And so, as far as I was concerned, his doggerel was bogus. How could it possibly be? There was a man, they said, was mad. The more he gave away, the more he had. Oh, I said to myself, I'm going to have to work this one out. And I'm still confronted with the challenge of it. And still tempted to doubt the truth of it. It's virtually impossible for us to live without thinking that Wall Street is the most important street in the whole world. And whether you have money in stocks or you don't, you will have been prevailed upon significantly enough by means of the media to believe that you better be worried when everyone else is worried. Now, of course, it would be wrong for us to dismiss these matters. Uh, Economics are important to our society. They are important to our world. The issues of international monetary policy are not without their significance. And therefore, we know that it is important, we've been told it enough time, to make sure that we have, amongst other things, an individual retirement account. And we are asked with frequency, do you have one? How much do you have in it? When did you make your last contribution to it? And so on. Well, I don't want to talk about IRAs this morning. I want for you to think with me about what I'm going to refer to as an IEA. An IEA. Namely, an individual eternal account. 
I want you to think with me this morning about this matter of spiritual investing, about having a portfolio that is eternal in its dimensions, about discovering what it means to be a church that really gives, about becoming the kind of individual who is as mad as the gentleman mentioned in the doggerel with which I began. And therefore, for each of us to be confronted by these same questions in relationship to an IEA, namely, do you have one? What's in it? And when did you make your last contribution to it? Now, if you allow your eyes to scan verses 14 to 20, let me talk you through the passage for just a moment. The apostle, you will notice, is commending the Philippians for their willingness to share in his troubles. He says that in verse 14. Also the fact that they are sharing with him in this matter of giving and receiving. Their care, he says in verse 16, is not sporadic, but it has been consistent insofar as they have done this sharing again and again. In emphasizing this, according to verse 17, he doesn't want them to think that he is motivated by what he will receive, but rather that they might understand that what stirs him is the benefit that will accrue to them as a result of their generosity. There's no question that he is in fine shape as a result of the gifts that have come to him via Epaphroditus. And indeed, He was confident that these gifts, according to the end of verse 18, were acceptable. They were like fragrant offerings. They were pleasing as a sacrifice to God. They should know, verse 19, that God will meet all their needs in accordance with His divine resources, and that these Philippian believers, as far as verse 20 is the outburst of His heart, these wonderful Philippian Christians have made the apostle's heart sing for joy. Now, with that as an overview, let me then go back to the beginning and seek to trace a line through the instruction that we have before us. I have a number of words, each of which begins with the letter P, in order to try and help me to remember my own outline. And the first of these is to note the partnership, the partnership, and considering verses 14, 15, and 16. The reason I use the word partnership is because of the existence of the word share, which you have there in verse 14, and you have it again in verse 15, not one church shared with me. Now, the word that is used there is the word that would be used for a partnership that exists between individuals. In the same way, if we stick with the stock market for a moment or two, we might say that we have shares in a certain company. We have a partnership with it, however limited or that we have a share of a certain business. Now, that is exactly what Paul is identifying here. He says, in this matter of the gospel, I am so thankful for the fact that we have been made partners. Now, the way in which he begins verse 14 is important to notice, because you will recall from our study last time that he had made clear to the Philippian believers that he had learned the secret of contentment. So, whether he received material benefit from them or whether he didn't, whether he lived in plenty or in poverty, whether he was well-fed or hungry, he had learned the secret of contentment. It perhaps then occurred to him that they might assume that he was being dismissive of the gifts that they had sent to him. And so, verse 14 would appear to exist in order to clear up any kind of misconception that may have emerged. He is not making light of their generosity. As Phillips paraphrases it, I am not disparaging the way in which you were willing to share in my troubles. I don't want you to think, he says, that uh, because I have learned the secret of contentment that I don't care about the fact that you are giving. He's about to go on and say he cares passionately about the fact that they're giving, but for a very different reason than they or we might be tempted to assume. Now, this partnership was marked by a number of things. First of all, it was an outstanding partnership. It was outstanding, inasmuch as it stood in direct contrast to the absence 
of this kind of fellowship from other churches. That's what he's saying here in verse 15. In the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, which was some 10 years prior to his now writing, in those early days, he says, when I set out from Macedonia, there wasn't another church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you folks. And so he says, the very fact of your partnership is outstanding. Here was a fledgling church. There were others who had been around longer. And yet, somehow or another, from the very outset, they had determined that they would be supportive of the Apostle Paul, recognizing all that he meant to them. The partnership was not only outstanding, but it was also long-standing. That's the significance of the phrase. You sent me aid, in verse 16 at the end, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. We all understand the distinction between making a one-time contribution and making a contribution that is marked by continuity. Every so often, someone might write and say, I am sending this to you, or I am giving this to this particular fund, or I want this used in this particular way, and please note that this is a one-time contribution. And then another may write and say, I am giving this to you because of the sense of urgency that I feel, and I want you to know that not only am I giving this in this way and on this day, but as God enables me, on this day, in a subsequent year, I will again give in this fashion. And that's why, although a decade has elapsed, here we find the Apostle Paul. He's in jail now in Rome. And these dear Philippian Christians, who had given right from the beginning, were still up to date with their commitments. Now, the other thing to note about the way in which they gave was simply this. Their giving was not, if you like, convivial. It was essential. You say, convivial? Is that a word? Frankly, I'm not sure, even as I say it myself right now, but um, I, I'm pretty certain it is. Convivial would be uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, uh, who live um, in uh, 47 Carsview Gardens with a poodle and uh, two garage door openers and a fairly extensive mortgage, invite Mr. and Mrs. Smith who live uh, two streets away with two poodles, one garage door opener, and an equally extensive mortgage. And they share similar backgrounds, similar interests, similar concerns, and they invite one another over for meals. And one month, it's the Smiths who host the Joneses, and the next month, it's the Jones who host the Smiths. And they have a kind of convivial relationship. And that, of course, is part of what makes the world go around, and it's very nice, and it's pleasurable, and there's nothing wrong with it at all. But essential sharing would be either the Jones or the Smiths going to another family whose circumstances are nowhere close to their own, whose needs are very deep, and inviting them to come and share the resources of their home and their hearth and their kitchen, and sending them on their way without any anticipation that this will be a reciprocal relationship, that this is some kind of convivial dimension of sharing. Indeed, they are convinced that they will never be invited to the home of this family. And furthermore, they have told them as they leave the driveway, now plan on this on the same Thursday next month, because we're going to do this all over again. That sharing was essential. That, incidentally, is the kind of sharing about which the Bible speaks in relationship to God's people. Isn't that something of what Jesus means when he says, if you love those who love you, what reward is there in that? Or to paraphrase it, if I invite people over to my home who like to invite me over to their home, what's the big deal? The real challenge is whether you or I are prepared to invite to our homes those who have no prospect of reciprocating by dint of their circumstances. Or even if they do, are so largely different from us on the outside that the world looks on and says, I don't know why 
those people are over with those people. They're not the same color as them. They didn't go to the same school as them. They don't have the same interests as them. They don't have the same resources as them. So they're scratching their heads. They're saying, what brings these people together? And the answer, of course, is Jesus brings these people together. Now, while it is true that every fellowship will largely represent the demographics of the environment in which it finds itself, which is a bit of a mouthful, simply meaning that if the church is down next to a park and a golf course, it is unlikely that we will be um, involved in a peculiar participation of inner-city dwellers who get up at 3 a.m. to find their way out to this place. Now, they may, and that would be fine. But by and large, it's unlikely. If we're going to do urban ministry, we'd be better to go and be urban. If we are suburban, or ruburban, or whatever the world we might be, then there is a sense in which there is an inevitability about that. I acknowledge that, but I refuse to accept that as the totality of what it means to enter into partnership. And I am exercised and concerned and increasingly consumed with the notion that the surrounding community can explain it away in the way that it can explain away any other secular gathering of people who have similar educations, similar financial resources, similar interests, and similar backgrounds. And so they come around and they say, well, of course, you don't need God or Christ or the Holy Spirit for anything that's going on here. We understand it perfectly. You're all sort of the same. And we have baptized cultural elements into our Christian professions to the extent that we do not cross boundaries, we do not build bridges across boundaries, both in terms of race, and in terms of finance, and in terms of education. And we have not, as a church, begun to scratch the surface of what it means to become that kind of multivarious community of people who are so disparate in our backgrounds that the explanation can only be their partnership is about the one who is the chairman and CEO and president, namely the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, to the extent that you believe that, share that, are concerned about that, want to do something about that, go and do something about it. I don't accept that, I refuse to accept that my African-American brethren can only worship in a certain cultural framework. They have decided that they want to, but they can worship somewhere else. Nor do I accept that a bunch of white people who can't beat time if their life depended on it, that they can only function in this fashion. It is not true. We have baptized a cultural milieu into our expressions of Christian faith. And that is one of the reasons that the world looks on and has such difficulty in understanding why it is that we think they should be beating our doors down to come out and find what the explanation is. There is no need for explanation. If you hang with those who like to hang with you, what reward do you have? Do not even pagans do that. Of course they do. They say, well, what does this mean? I don't know what it means, but I just wanted to mention it in passing. <laughs> I don't have to have all the answers. All I'm saying is, if you had moved amongst the Philippian believers, this stuff has got to mean something. There's neither barbarian, slave, Jew, Gentile, bond, free, whatever else it is. Let's take another one. My Jewish, uh, Messianic Jewish brethren. Are you telling me now that we're supposed to have messianic churches? So that that is distinct from the barbarians and the Scythians and the Gentiles? Absolutely not. 
That was what Acts 15 was all about. They wanted to go back and say, unless you are circumcised in the way the Jews determine, you cannot be a true believer. And Paul and Peter go head to head on the issue. And Paul says, Peter, you're flat out wrong on this, and you shouldn't give up on this. And if you do give up on this, it will have a major effect on the future of the church. Therefore, I resist you to your faith. You cannot baptize this cultural factor into the essentials of Christianity. Not if your sharing is going to be on the basis of the radical difference that Jesus makes. All of that to say this. When partnership, when fellowship, is galvanized in an understanding of the grace of God in Christ, then at least to some degree, loved ones, there must be the indications amongst us of the difference that Jesus makes. And that, it seems to me, demands that we as individuals and as families cross bridges ourselves in order that as individuals we may understand, embrace, be involved in a kind of fellowship that is not only cross-cultural and cross-racial and cross-everything else, but is radically driven by the kind of partnership to which Paul is referring here. A challenging message about spiritual investing from Alistair Begg and Truth For Life. As Alistair spoke about the consistency of the Philippians' generosity, I couldn't help but think about a group of individuals who have shown that kind of ongoing love for the people who hear this program. I'm talking about our truth partners who donate each month so that Alistair's messages are available to all of us free of charge. If you are a truth partner, I want to take just a minute and say thank you from myself, from the entire team at Truth For Life, and from your fellow listeners. And whether you give every month as a truth partner or you make a one-time donation today, we've selected a helpful book that we would love to send you as a tangible way of saying thanks. This is a 31-day devotional titled Contentment, Seeing God's Goodness. The danger of discontentment may not seem as threatening as other temptations, and yet its destructive influence on our lives robs us of the joy that should mark God's children. How do we ward off the cycle of wanting more than what God's given us? And how can we develop a greater sense of peace and satisfaction regardless of our circumstances? This devotional is written to help us gain focus on Jesus as our source of joy rather than on our current situation. As you work through the 31 inspiring readings, you'll find a renewed sense of freedom from the dissatisfaction that is so prevalent in our world. Request your copy of Contentment, Seeing God's Goodness, when you donate today. Call 888-588-7884 or go to truthforlife.org slash donate. While you're on the website, be sure to sign up for the Truth For Life daily devotional as well. Life is busy and it can be hard to spend a silent moment with God in prayer, but this devotional is an easy way to start your day in God's Word. When you request the daily devotional, we'll send it each morning to your email inbox. You can easily view it on your phone or your tablet. Visit truthforlife.org and scroll to the bottom of our homepage for your free subscription. I'm Bob Lapine for Alistair Begg and all of us at Truth For Life, wishing you a restful weekend as you worship with your church family. Keep in mind, if you're looking to supplement your study time over the weekend, you're invited to join Alistair and the congregation at Parkside Church via live stream Sunday morning at 945 Eastern Time. The service will remain available throughout the day. Simply go to truthforlife.org slash live. And then join us Monday as we continue learning how to build our spiritual investment portfolio. Today's program was furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.